In this lesson we're going to talk about how did Stalin rise to power. In the last lesson we touched briefly at the end of the foreign policy um, section, we touched briefly on the fact that Lenin died, okay, and we now have to start looking at the power vacuum that existed within the Communist Party, within the Bolshevik Party, um, following the death of Lenin, and then talk about what it was that led to Stalin becoming the new leader of the Soviet Union. So we're going to take an introduction to have a look at Stalin's resume, almost, within within the Soviet Union, before we then move on to the issues that took place. So things like um, different opinions, arguments around um, the extent to, so, uh, to the spread of socialism across the world, and also the extent of the NEP and industrialization as well. So we're going to begin by looking at... The, as an introduction, what Stalin really did, whereabouts he sort of fit within this um, within this quite complex story of the development of the Bolshevik Party and the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. So, with that being said, we should really talk about the key positions that he held within the Communist Party to get an, an idea of the of the relative power um, he possessed. So, in 1919, he was the head of the org bureau okay and then from there in 2020 uh, in 1922 he assumed position of the secretary general of the communist party of the communist party the communist party so we're starting to see that you know he held a very um, um quite a um, quite a a prestigious position within the communist party and in 1924, he initiated what was something called the Lenin Enrollment, okay, which was a way in which 128,000 people were able to join the Communist Party. And then this, with this being said, with this sort of growth in party membership, began they began we began to see the divisions uh, ideologically within the party itself. So we start to see, for example, um, the the arguments, shall we say, the, the division in ideology over whether one should um, be pursuing a permanent revolution or um, socialism in one country. So these were the sort of two conflicting ideas. And on top of the debates around the NEP, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, we'll discuss this in a minute, discuss later, uh, there was also debates around the policy of revolution, okay, whether or not um, there should be what was known as a permanent revolution, which meant um, spreading the revolution um, to, you know, to into regimes in more developed countries, and then that could um, support the, the building of socialism around the world. So we're sort of seeing, um, trying to push, trying to push uh, for international spread of socialism international international spread of socialism you know which is something that um, Lenin believed would be the only um, way in which a socialist state could exist ultimately what Lenin believed was that if you had a socialist state um, effectively surrounded by the you know the rest of the world which was capitalist in nature it'd be very very difficult to achieve a kind of model of socialism and to spread socialism and so therefore having a international um, socialist revolution is what he envisaged and what others on the part on the on the part of the left of the party would envisage but this would mean there would exist a permanent revolution okay so the revolution wouldn't end with the USSR so it wouldn't end with 1917, wouldn't end with the USSR, but it would, you know, spread, you know, to to other to other uh, developed nations. Whereas, on the other side of the coin, on the other side of the debate, was the idea of just having socialism in one country, which was the which was the quote used, and this was the belief that. Um, the, the aims of permanent revolution, that the motivation of permanent revolution was unlikely. So the idea of permanent revolution, the idea of permanent 
permanent revolution was uh, was unrealistic so you could you know you know it's all fine and dandy to say that uh, we should be pushing towards international um, socialist revolutions across the world however the extent to which that's even possible um, is 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 unlikely so we should really be pushing more towards socialism in one country bolstering and developing our own socialism and our own state before we start to spread it abroad and you know there is some historical support or historical evidence you know some justification for this belief because we've as we talked about in the last lesson we had um, failed revolutions in germany and hungary we also had the russo-polish war so russo-polish war which was a a conflict um where the where the Soviet Union wanted to bring about socialism to Poland with you know within the context of um you know within the context of empowering their working class to rise up against uh, against against the bourgeois um, elites, however in that case um, Poland saw this as just another example of 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 Russian expansionism, and so decided um you know to um, challenge the the. Uh, the the imposition from from the socialist state, and also again, namely in Germany and Hungary, we had the German Revolution in nineteen eighteen, which brought about the brought about the creation of the Weimar state, um, a very liberal state, and with that being said, the the sort of division within the extremists of 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 politics within Germany. Um, in this very early period of the Weimar state, uh, they were very much on the fringe edges. They didn't really come into the picture until uh, until uh, 1929, and and then at the collapse of the Weimar Republic and the rise of uh, of the Nazi Party and Adolf Hitler. Of course, that's a different story. But uh, as we're seeing that these revolutions failed in 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 these countries, so it doesn't make sense to suggest that we should be pushing for this idea of permanent revolution because. Not only are they unrealistic, just in theory, think about it, but they also uh, there is no justification to believe that they would work um, if they haven't worked in the past with these states here. And because of this, the fail uh, because of this failure of socialism in the rest of the world, it could be argued that the Soviet Union should be preserved. So they believe that there was um, that pushing for social uh, for permanent revolution um, could it, it could risk it could risk the integrity of the of the USSR is the integrity integrity of the USSR and so they thought that it, the the most um, important thing to do would be to ensure that that there would be uh, that the Soviet Union would exist and would be protected uh, against anything else before we start to look at um, spreading revolution elsewhere so that was one side of the debate within the Communist Party. The next part of the debate we talked about very briefly when we discussed the NEP in a lot more detail, but we, the, there was a lot of debate around the NEP, the New Economic Plan. And in terms of ideological tendencies, the NEP went against communist ideals, because if we if we think back to the video on the NEP, the NEP. Um, pushed for and 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 legislated a number of what would be just considered um, very capitalist um, policies um, so there was a denationalization denationalization of small industries okay of small industries which would effectively mean uh, you know uh, which would, if we, we're going to um, put this into context, denationalization effectively means privatization. Okay, we're talking about putting an industry into the hands of the market. Okay, and this led to the Soviet Union in this time under the NEP being what we call a mixed economy. A mixed economy, and we have a mixed economy uh, today. So, a mixed economy, there's generally two ways of looking at um, the there are two there are generally two ways in which we can look at 
uh, the the uh, uh, situation of the economy. We could talk about privatization, where all industry uh, and all the means of production are within the, within the um, the hands of 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 the private sector, so within uh, the market. And then you've also got the idea of nationalization, where you have um, these industries being put under control of, of the of the government of the you know of, in the public sector. Now, in the UK, we have got privatised industries, you know, things uh, like rail, and we've also got nationalised industries, things like the NHS, healthcare. And so therefore, we have what we call a mixed economy, which is sort of like a balance between the two. And now, this mixed economy, I mean, unless you want to argue that the United Kingdom is a socialist state, uh, mixed economy doesn't imply that... Um, it doesn't really go uh, in favour of the communist ideals that we are talking about. So therefore, there was a lot of challenge to the NEP. And Lenin argued that the NEP was just a temporary measure to recover from the Russian Civil War. Don't forget they went through World War One and the Russian Civil War. And by 1925, the NEP was causing um, industrial and agricultural decline. So it, it caused, uh, and initially it following, so following the Civil War, following the uh, civil war it was successful it was successful you know it brought back um, industries and, and we see the we see the electrification of a number of areas of the state that were um, destroyed by either world war one or the civil war take your pick and so we have um, a, you know a boom following the russian civil war but by 1925 we see a decline and a system of grain hoarding had become common practice among among agricultural among the agricultural sector so we have this problem going on here as well we have grain hoarding becoming common practice so therefore the NEP didn't actually look um, like it was being very successful and therefore this caused an NEP struggle in the party on the left of the party the likes of um, Trotsky for example uh, Zinoviev um, they wanted to see uh, an abolition of the NEP. They wanted to see the NEP bring come to an end, and instead push for a policy of rapid industrialization, because the Russian state still needed a lot of industrialization at this point. On the right of the party, people like Bukharin um, argued that the NEP should continue. Okay, so we are seeing uh, fundamentally a, two contrasting, contradictory opinions around the NEP. And in 1928, Stalin had supported, um, had previously supported the NEP. However, he abandoned this in support of uh, rapid industrialization. This would become a common theme uh, among Stalin Stalinist ideas. Uh, so this is a common theme. A common theme that's going on. So with that being said, how did Stalin defeat his opposition? Because it wasn't like he was the only person who wanted the job uh, when Lenin died. Stalin's changes uh, of mind and uh, with the support of different policies allowed him to defeat other contenders for power. So like I've just said here, this being a common theme that he abandoned ideas and supported other ideas, he would change his mind constantly in these early periods as a way to try and you know get support from um, different groups within the communist party he defeated the left opposition by forming an alliance with Zinoviev and uh, Kamenev uh, and this undermined Trotsky arguably Trotsky being um, arguably his main opposition so arguably arguably main opposition we're going to talk in the next lesson about the general ideologies and policies of all the people who were in contention for power. So we're going to talk about Trotsky in more detail, we're going to talk about Zinoviev and Kamenev, and we're going to talk about Bukharin, and we're going to talk about why, what they believed, where they came from, okay, um, why and why they were a unable to secure power um, where Stalin was successful. By initially advocating for the continuation of the new economic plan, the new economic policy, uh, Stalin's support uh, was supported by Bukharin. Okay, so he had gained support from these two areas of the party. When he was opposed by Zinoviev, uh, Kamenev, and Trotsky, he began to get communist support to expel them from the party. So there was a so it, you know it wouldn't be an underestimation, a, a un, uh, you know, 
yeah an underestimation to claim that there was a definitely a power struggle going on in this in this period of time and Stalin used a number of interesting tactics being able to change his mind on different policies to gain support when he needed it from different people within the party and was able to um, expel others from the party at this time as well so in the next lesson we're going to talk about these individual people within the within the communist party and talk about why they were successful and why they um, failed um, to even you know gain power uh, where you know where Stalin managed to succeed